today. Thank you. Good morning, Carla. Morning, all of Facebook. Sheila and Kathy and I were talking. Good morning, Kathy. Good morning, Joyce. Good morning, Bob and Kim. And I'm here to announce that our HIS ministry, which is Hands in Service, is having our first meeting of 2021 on January the 12th at 6 p.m. This is a very important meeting, which we will be drawing Secret Sisters for 2021. We would love to have all you ladies join us and be a part of this wonderful group. Uh, be here at 6 o'clock and join us and we will have a good time. Tomorrow on Monday, January the 4th at 10 a.m., we will be meeting to take down Christmas decorations here at the church. Just we can use anybody that's able to come and help. We can use men, women, and we can even use kids. So come out and help us get this job done. Thank you. And we want to listen to that first part uh, about the meeting really, tomorrow night, but that second part, my nose Christmas is already taken down. We apologize for that. Let's stand together and welcome. We're glad you're with us today. Let's praise our great Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who brings us together in Him under His blood. Through his life, let's celebrate it today. In the love every breath I breathe, the author of all eternity, giver of every perfect thing, to be all glory. Maker of heaven and of earth, there's no one can comprehend your word. The king over all the universe, to you be the glory. And I am alive because I'm alive in you. And it's all because of Jesus I'm alive. And it's all because the blood of Jesus Christ that covers me and raised this dead man's life. And it's all because of Jesus I'm alive. Healer of every breath I breathe author of all eternity, giver of every perfect thing, to you be the glory, the maker of heaven and earth, there's no one can comprehend your word, king over all the universe, to you be the glory, and I am alive because I'm alive in you. It's all because the blood 
But you know what? They keep on being faithful. They keep on supporting the work of the church here and forwarding Amen. the gospel through their gifts and things. And I would like right now for us not to thank them because they would, most of them would say, no, 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 no. You've got it wrong if you thank me. I would like for us to thank the Lord for their faithfulness. Let's thank them. <laughs> thank you for being in the Lord's will, folks. We're going to sing a couple songs today and hear a message, meet around the Lord's table. Uh, there may be decisions today, too. Let us pray that the Spirit of God works here and is in us and is communicated to the world around us through us this week. Let's go to him in prayer before we, we praise his name again. Father, hallelujah, what a Savior you are. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for your ways that are perfect, your ways that are above our ways. We thank you, Lord, that you will guide us in our paths here that we walk on this earth as you've promised. You will keep our ways straight if we trust in you. Lord, help us to trust in you like never before. Help us to seek your face hard like we've never done before. Lord, may we be serious about being the church in a world that is broken and hurting and falling apart because of sin. Lord, thank you for the remedy, the only remedy that works, Jesus. We praise him today. We offer this worship to you. May everything be a blessing in your sight uh, to you, Lord. We, we're here to, to offer our praise to you as a sacrifice this day. May we be about the business of bringing you glory. For that is why we've been placed here. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's continue. Worship. What a mind-blowing thought this is. You, through the blood of Jesus, can be a friend of your creator. Who am I that you are mindful of me? That you hear me when I call. And is it true that you are thinking of me? Oh, how you love me. It's amazing. And you and my and you are mindful of me. That you hear me. When I call, Lord, 
Is it true that you are thinking of me? Or oh, I love me? It's amazing. And I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. Who am I that you are mindful of me? That you hear me when I Is it true that you are thinking of me? Oh, how you love me. It's amazing. It's amazing. So amazing. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of descendants of Abraham in Christ, the church. You are a friend of God Almighty when you are under the blood of Jesus Christ. Let's Amen. not take that friendship for granted. Yes. Let's protect it. Let's um, treat it as something, as the most valuable thing in this, on this earth. Our holy God has reached out to us as sinful creatures and says, I'm going to be your friend, even though it's going to cost us the death of my son. I'm going to sing one more song before the sermon today. I think it's one of the most beautiful songs written in recent history by Matt Redman. And Chris is going to lead us in this uh, most beautiful song. <laughs> we can start counting and we get to 10,000 reasons to praise the Lord. We just be scratching the surface. Sing those, please.
And I'm going to tell you, that's a life-changing week when you get to do that every day. Some of you know that uh, I got her a Christmas gift. What was it? It was a Bible. You're never too young to start hearing and being read the Bible to you until you can do that yourself. Yes. Her dad, Brian Schultz, and I each day took turns. We rotated different stories. And the last night I was there, they, they asked me to tell a story, and I'll tell you about that later. But why would we tell 10-day-old Cameron and younger the story of Jesus? We want her from the earliest days to follow him, to know him, to build a relationship with him. And I want you to know that uh, though I'm not here, there today, Cameron Hope Schultz is attending Central Christian Church at Fort Smith, Arkansas with her parents for her first day of worship together with other believers the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and God the Father who created the heavens and the earth. Yes. Amen. What a great thing when parents know God, follow Jesus, and want to join in the community of the church and they share faith and life together. That's what we do here too. And thank you for coming today. I, I think this concept of growing closer to family and digging deeper in the word is exactly appropriate because that's our theme as we're starting the new year. We're trying to go deeper in our faith, in our worship, in our Bible study, and in our prayer. And I hope you've appreciated those who in the first 10 days of the year have contributed to, to devotions that we put on Facebook. And I hope if you follow my Facebook page, you've seen uh, a daily chapter of the book of Proverbs each day. We want you to go deeper in God's word. We want you to, to know that's a foundation for life because deeper joy comes from your personal experience of seeing and hearing and, and touching the body of Christ here on earth but reaching out to the face of God and having a relationship with his son Jesus. I want you to know I, deeper joy is what I, I want you to have when you, you follow Jesus. And godly men and godly women want their children and the children of their children to follow Jesus. That has always been ever since the day of those who walked with Jesus. You know, I, I, I love it when children of children of I know here in the the church uh, stopped by out of the blue, just coming to church. Before I left to go to uh, Fort Smith, Arkansas, Andrew Ball came to the church office. He walked in the foyer, came right up to the window, and he was in a more talkative mood than normal. And he came right up to me and he said, hey, old man, how are you doing? <laughs> And I said, what do you mean, old man? He said, well, you're a grandpa. That means you're an old man. <laughs> it's amazing how you go from a young man to an old man just like that. But I guess when you start seeing multiple generations of your family and your friends and their family, you begin to realize you're an older man. I want you to turn with me and I want you to see the older man who wrote 1 John, 2 John, 3 John in your Bible. If you have your Bible, turn in the New Testament to those letters. And I want you to know his life story. He, he became a follower of Christ as uh, a brother and he were mending their nets and Jesus said, Call, come follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. He might have been 28, 29, or at least A.D. 28, 29 when that happened. And then I want you to know the church began roughly 33 A.D. After the 30 years of Jesus' life, his three-year ministry, he was put on the Christ cross. He, he died and was buried and rose again. And uh, so about 
roughly 33 AD, the church begins. 50 days after the resurrection, John was there when Peter preached. And 3,000 babes in Christ accepted the message of the good news that Jesus died, buried, and rose again. God raised his son from the dead. And that there was new hope for that generation. 3,000 accepted Christ. They were born again and part of the kingdom of God. By Acts 4, though, there was opposition to those who believed that message, preached that message publicly, and Peter and John were put in prison overnight for that. In fact, they were later brought before the Sanhedrin, and they were specifically told, stop preaching, stop preaching. It wasn't long before this godly man, John, along with his brother James and Peter, became known as pillars, the backbone of the early church. By Acts 12, though, about A.D. 62, John's brother, James, you, you remember James and John, they were called the sons of thunder. Somebody probably didn't like the way James preached and he was beheaded for preaching the gospel. That's not John the Baptist. That's James who got the same punishment. John's fellow apostles all got persecuted no matter where they went to every point of the globe. In the first 40 years of the church's existence, eventually 11 of those apostles even Peter and Paul, who were put to death by approximately A.D. 68. These apostles never denied Jesus was the Christ and risen from the grave. That's an outstanding message, but it begs the question, would men die for what they know is a lie? And I would say no. They live because they believe he lived yes. for them. And that's strong evidence they believe. And that's why we today share the stories they share to our children and the children of our children. By A.D. 70, John flees from Jerusalem. Pressure happens. He goes to Ephesus. And he begins to work with that church uh, along with a younger man named Timothy. But about that same time, Simon Magus, who in Acts 8 is called Simon the Sorcerer, begins to say he's a follower of Jesus. Declares some faith. But Peter rebukes him because he doesn't get it. It hasn't become real to him. And so Simon turns from the New Testament teaching of the apostles and he founds a group of that day known as the Gnostics. And the Gnostics began to deny Jesus' identity and with great passion and false doctrines, they created divisions in the church of that era. And great havoc was extended everywhere the apostles went. And so I just want to say, if we think we have some troubles here today in our world, the church has always battled to stay faithful to our Lord. But have you ever noticed there's a lot of fake stuff in our world? Infomercials about products that don't work the way they appear on TV. Fruit juices that are not really made of fruit and burgers that aren't made of meat. There are singers who can't really sing. They only lip sync. Remember Millie Vanilli? And have you ever seen those beautiful front pages on magazines only to find they're airbrushed on the purpose to hide the blemish of the model? You behold. But worst of all, for us who follow Jesus, ever since the time of John, there have been fake 
preachers and teachers and fake messages. We got to know the truth. The church's best defense is the truth. The truth that comes from those who walked and talked and touched and saw Jesus appear after the resurrection as they wrote to the church of their day to stay faithful. That's why we have the gospel, the good news, the Bible. You see, way back in A.D. 33, the Apostle Paul or John and Peter were in prison overnight. They were told to stop preaching. Peter and John replied, salvation is found in no one else. There is no name under heaven whereby given to man that we can be saved. If he's the only savior, we can't stop preaching. And they even said, as for us, we can't stop speaking what we've seen, what we've heard. Roughly 85 to 90 AD, while he's in Ephesus, John writes what we call the, the Gospel of John, the letter of a book of John, the, the biography of the life of Jesus. And John was present at the Last Supper where he records in John chapter 14. I these are the words of Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. John heard that. He believed that. He wrote that. He preserved that. And we must proclaim that. Roughly 95 to 96 AD, John suffered personal persecution. All the other apostles most likely had been put to death by this time. But instead of putting John, the last apostle, to death, they exiled him to the island of Patmos. If you have the books, your Bible with you, and you have Bible maps in the back, look for the city of Ephesus and look for the island of Patmos. You could go visit the island of Patmos today. And so they spared his life, but they hoped to isolate him, to separate him from others who were sharing the truth in order to stop the message. I want to tell you, you can't stop the message. God's people will take it and receive from the Father wherever they are. Don't worry about suppression of the truth. You know what happened on the island of Patmos? He received what we call the book of Revelation. And he wrote that revelation from God to warn all the churches, you better stay faithful. You need to walk with the Father. It's better that you not be lukewarm or I'll spew you out of my mouth. I love Romans or Revelation 2.10 where the angel says to the church, be faithful unto death and you'll receive the crown of life. And what John heard from the angel, the messenger of God on that island, I believe is true today. We must stay faithful. And one day when we die, forever, because we've been a friend of God and his son Jesus, we'll gain heaven. We'll gain heaven. John didn't die on the island of Patmos. He got a chance to go back to Ephesus from roughly 96, 97 to maybe as late as 100 AD while living out the last days of his life most believe he wrote these three letters 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and so what would you want those that you now have in the church that are 70 years removed from when you first met Christ to do, to hear, to, to, to follow because you know your days are numbered. And here's what he wrote. He wrote the truth that begins in 1 John chapter 1 and he was emphasizing to them, to them 
you need to know Jesus and you need to forever build up the kingdom. Would, would you look at the first verses of uh, 1 John 1, 1 through 4, and help me with the slide. We're going to see what he wrote. He wrote there in 1 John, and I'll just read it from my scriptures. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked at, which our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life, Jesus, appeared. We have seen it. We testify to it. We proclaim it to you. The eternal life with which the Father has appeared to us. Notice that word he called of Jesus, the eternal life. That's profound. Verse 3, we proclaim to you what we've seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us and that our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we write this to make our joy complete. Uh, there's some powerful lessons here. He's testifying that I've been with Jesus and if you know Jesus, your joy is going to be plentiful. And I think that's the hope that I would want to share for you today in this very week, this very day of worship. But I want you to ask the question, what beginning is John talking about? I, I think there's the possibility of four, but I'm going to lean toward number four when we get there. Beginning. Number one, that he could have said that which was from the beginning. He could have been referring to the beginning of time when creation commenced. Remember Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So when the book of Genesis uses the word in the beginning, it begins to announce history is starting. Time is beginning. And they use this dimension of time to focus on what we get to be a part of even today, history of the world. Now, if you're an evolutionist, you have been taught that the earth is 50, 500 million years old, or maybe even a billion years old. And the earth started off with a bang. And that you and I are here by random chance. But if you're a creationist, you've been taught the earth is around 6,000 years old. God was there in the beginning, and from the outset of time, it was designed and giving you and I, the creation, a purpose. Now, creationists believe three significant aspects of the beginning in Genesis 1. Verse 1, God created the heavens and the earth. God spoke, let there be light. I like to believe, bang, it happened. And so God was the first bang. The real Big Bang Theory. And God said eventually after he made the stars, the sun, the moon, the waters separated then, the land masses, the, the bird, the fowls, the fish, and the land animals, he then made man. And God said something pretty profound. Let us make man in our image. There's a little girl who heard the story of God's creation. She heard it in Sunday school. She went home and her mom asked her what she learned. And she explained the creation of man to her mom this way. God made man of the dust of the ground. God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life. Then God stepped back and looked at man. And he said, I think he can do, I can do better than that. I will create woman. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> There's something profound that God said when he said, let us make man and woman in our image. 
Who is he talking to? Who is God talking to? And so as far back as Genesis 1, it records a beginning where God was already there. Now, beginning number two, I think, and I want you to hang in here with me, is the beginning of eternity. I think eternity started before the world was created and eternal, uh, eternity will continue when uh, the world might be destroyed and a new uh, created. You see, uh, there was a beginning of eternity that existed before creation where a deity was present. If you go to the Gospel of John, the life story of Jesus, look at how John tells you Jesus came into the world. Look at John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. Now, I'm just telling you, that's pretty amazing. That's pretty insightful. John is saying that when all creation came into existence, our Lord Jesus was already in existence with God. Look at verse 2. The Word was God. And so since Jesus already existed before creation, he himself was not created. God in eternity before the universe began. And so since he's uncreated, he had to be eternal. Remember John saying, the eternal life. And so since Jesus is without a beginning, he must too be God. Verse 3, through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Somehow, God and Jesus teamed up to create the universe. They worked together. They were side by side. Jesus helped create all things. God in the Word was present before the world, the heavens, and the earth were created. Paul in Colossians 1, 15 and 17 agrees. It says he, referring to Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, where the thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him, Jesus, and for him, Jesus. And he is before all things, and in him, all things hold together. John said, we're in the hands of Jesus if we're in the world. That's why we've got to trust he's in control. He could open up his hands and let it fly. But I don't think it's quite ready, but I want you to be ready for whatever day he chooses. Beginning number three also comes from John's gospel. Go down to verse 14. It talks about the word that was God with God and made the world. Then it says the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. And that's the way John tells the Christmas story. That's how he tells the story of Jesus' birth without angels, without Mary, without Joseph, without shepherd, without wise men. He, he says there was a time God came and was birthed in Bethlehem. He stepped from the throne in heaven, came into the world, and he was the reason for the Christmas season we just celebrated. Don't let that celebration stop. But I'm believing there's a fourth beginning that may be a better beginning John is referring to. When John 1.1 1, 1 says that which was from the beginning, it could be the beginning of time. It could be the beginning of eternity. It could be the beginning of Jesus' incarnation. 
But I kind of think John makes it personal and it's the beginning of him having a eyewitness story of Jesus. When he began to hear Jesus, see Jesus, touch Jesus, and know he was truly a friend of Christ. I think he's referring to the beginning of the events from John 1.15 to the end of the book he wrote. Then he said, these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. And by believing, you will have life in his name. I think that's the beginning he's talking about. The beginning of the life with Jesus that I got to see. Now look with me. Let's answer the question. What was John's experience with Jesus? Here's an old man. He's in Ephesus. He's writing the book. It's farewell letters to family and friends. He wants them to follow Christ. He said, that which was from the beginning, that which we have heard, that which we have seen with our eyes, that which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this is what we proclaim concerning the word of life. Do you remember the first time John probably heard Jesus speak to him? Matthew chapter 4 verse 18, you see that Jesus is walking probably by the Sea of Galilee and he calls two fishermen, Peter and, and, and Andrew, those two brothers, and he says, come follow me, I will make you fishers of men. And they leave their boats and follow Jesus. And then the Bible says he went to, the, to see the sons of Zebedee, James and John. He asked them to follow me. They were mending their nets. Some translations say mending. Some say preparing. Some people say because he came out of a time of mending nets, that was just the nature of his pastoral work was always mending lives back to the fellowship of Christ. But he heard Jesus say, come follow me. And the testimony of Matthew was immediately they left their father's boats and followed Jesus. Can you imagine personally hearing the word, come follow me, from Jesus. What are you going to do? Well, honestly, he's asking you today that same question. He says, I love you. I gave my life for you. I will be with you always to the end of the age. Nothing, nothing will take you out of my hand. I want you to work with me. I want you to work for me until I come again. And John is saying Jesus had a voice and I heard it. Now, I, I want to give you a little Bible trivia. Do you, do you know what the only miracle is that's recorded in all the four Gospels? It's the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. I don't know why, but each of them have that story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. You know, Friday night, uh, before we went to bed, Ryan Schultz asked me, uh, why don't you uh, tell a story to Cameron about uh, something from the Bible? And I just quickly said, oh, how about the story of Adam and Eve? And he goes, no, 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 don't start that. <laughs> I don't know if he thought maybe nakedness was going to come into the story or sin was going to be brought up on that night. He said, why don't you tell a story of the feeding of the 5,000? And so because it's something I've learned from my 15 years and told us a youth minister, and I have preached on that subject here from this pulpit, I went into a story and Lee recorded it. <laughs> And I, I, if you get a chance, ask Lee to show that to you. There's a standing when the story is done. I, I, I will tell you, 
ask Lee, let her share that. But John was one of the four disciples who excitedly told that same story in their life story of Jesus. And each of them were saying, we have seen Jesus do this with our own eyes. We heard him ask for food. We saw him break the loaves. He may have even touched us when he handed us the baskets to, to disperse to the multitudes. He appeared to 5,000 when it was all over. There were leftovers. And the people wanted to make him. That's a sight that John saw. And John is a disciple who let Jesus touch him. He let him touch his feet. At the Last Supper. Ha ha. Listen again. Our hands have touched. This we proclaim. I, I got to think. Of where, where did Jesus touch him that left an impression forever? Did Jesus give John a handshake when he followed Jesus after he called him to become a fisher of me? Welcome to the group. It's not going to be easy. But it will be worth it all. Did Jesus give, John give Jesus a hand in the boat when Peter tried walking on the water that night, shortly following the feeding of 5,000? Here, Jesus, let me help you in your boat. Here, Peter, I'll help you too. Did that touch Resonate? Was it remembered? Man, I just saw something special. Did John pat Jesus on the back and say good job when he raised Lazarus from the dead? Wow, that was pretty awesome. Well, John bragged in the gospel that he was a beloved disciple and he even mentioned I leaned against Jesus' breast at the last supper table. Was that a touch he never forgot? And was he there when Thomas said, unless I touch, I won't believe he's risen? I think he was. They had a chance to touch, but nobody was willing. Nobody. Sight was enough for them to believe. You see, uh, they spent time with Jesus. They heard Jesus. They saw Jesus. They touched Jesus. And these 12 apostles were, were people who were threatened. You stop preaching. And they said, we can't stop preaching what we've seen and heard. And old Sanhedrin, I forgot to tell you, he touched us. You see, Jesus appeared to these apostles for 40 days after his resurrection. And in those 40 days, he gave them the challenge to go into all the world and make disciples tell my story. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. And those disciples literally went to every part of the known world at that time. And they were persecuted everywhere they went. And so, church, don't be surprised if there's some opposition or persecution for those of you and us here in America or around the world for following Jesus. I want to close with this. Spending time with Jesus just brings joy <laughs> that you can't talk, talk, stop talking about. I can't tell you how much joy it was to hold camp to see her, to hear her little goolers, her burps, to experience this real baby. And I can show you this picture, but that picture is only half the joy of what I experienced for eight days. Amen. And that's the way it is with Jesus. 
We only get pictures, snapshots out of scripture by people who literally saw him, heard him, touched him, saw him after the resurrection, and they can't stop talking. And the joy was so great, they, they even would sing and encourage their church to sing. And the church has been singing for years upon years about their relationship with Jesus. And that's why so many choose at their funeral to sing that familiar hymn in the garden. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear. The Son of God discloses and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am your own his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known folks I, I, I'm so blessed to have grown up in a home that from my infancy I have heard of Jesus and I was told to follow him. He would become my savior. And, and, and I fought it. I didn't want it. I didn't think I could be a preacher. But in God's providence, I'm here today. Amen. But what I have in the joy of Jesus, I want you to have personally in your life, your, your marriage, in your children and in the home you have. And when we come together, we just celebrate what we all have in Jesus. Would you stand with me? I think the truth is when we experience Jesus personally, it's going to bring a testimonial joy. You just can't stop telling what you've seen and heard. And it's a joy that passes understanding to those who don't understand who Jesus is. There's a person in our church who I think joins a lot of us, and I'm sorry you can't see that little white print as well as possible, but uh, uh, this person put this out today. I thought to myself, I'm really losing hope in the world, and just for a moment, I started to feel pretty negative about that. But then I was reminded my net hope was never meant to be in the world. My hope is meant to be in the Lord. Amen. And he has already conquered the world. Yes, Lord. I have told you these things so that you may have peace. In this world you may have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Yes. Jesus gives you that kind of hope, peace, and joy. And I'm going to challenge the church, let's dig deeper into his word. Let's continue with personal prayer and Bible study. Let's walk and talk with Jesus. And I think no matter what happens in 2001 or the years to come or till the day we die, we can have peace and joy in Christ that passes understanding. Would you walk with Jesus with me? Maybe the first walk you might need to do if you haven't ever done it before is down the aisle to the front at this moment just to say, I think I want that kind of Jesus. I believe in that kind of Jesus. He's real to me today. I want to live for him forever. Hear, believe, repent, confess, be baptized. That's what Jesus taught after he arose. That's what the church practiced. That's what we offer in Jesus' name. Those who do those things, hear, believe, repent, confess, and are baptized, I believe are saved by the blood of Christ that he shed at Calvary. And then you will have the power of the resurrection he had that came on Easter Sunday that first time. What hope, what joy, what peace. They can let us face anything going on in our household, in this city, with the busy traffic, or in the nation or even the world with Christ he makes your joy complete <laughs> dig deeper in the word and find joy in Jesus that's the fellowship we get would you enjoy that fellowship today would you unite with Christ 
Would you join his body, the church, if that's the need? Please come. Stand with me if that's your need. Savior, I come. 
As we come to a time of uh, remembering the Lord today as we meet around this table, um, let me tell you a quick story. Back in, I believe it was 1986, my little brother was losing his eyesight due to diabetes. I remember praying on numerous nights, days, in my apartment where I lived by myself in a little apartment in a not so great area of Columbus, Ohio, where I was a youth minister. I remember Cars driving down the street, didn't know the car just on the other side of that front room wall. There was a guy laying on his face, literally, praying that Mike would lose his eyesight. He did. He lost his eyesight. He lost his battle a few years later, altogether, in this life. Now, I could have said after all that agonizing in prayer, that's a scriptural term, in fact, that I could have said, you know, that wasn't worth it. That was a waste of time. Anybody with a half ounce of maturity in Christ knows that would be foolish to say that. Every minute of prayer, every minute of communion with our Lord, every minute of service, every act of service, it's not for not, it counts. It's not ignored by the Lord. The scripture tells us that your labor in the Lord is not in vain in 1 Corinthians. And what we do here today, some people might say, well, we get together, it doesn't matter whether I attend church every week or not, it doesn't matter whether we have the Lord's Supper every week, it doesn't matter if I, I give or I worship or whatever. I want to tell you, every moment of that matters to the Lord. Amen. It pleases Him. And that's what we want to do, isn't it? Please Him. More than anything else, if not, that's where we need to get to. Today, as we meet around the Lord's table, I want to encourage you, brothers and sisters, every time we, every time, Jesus said, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, Paul told us that, actually, every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, we remember the Lord. Let's, uh, let's do that today. Let's focus on that cross we just sang about. Ask God to lead us there because it's at that cross where our lives um, zero out. You know, that's where the focus returns. Lord, lead us to the cross. Let's pray before we pray. Lord, thank you. We know you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. We know that you are ever aware of what we are doing, what we are saying, and when we approach you. We know that all of our prayers, Lord, when we're in your will, that they're, they're heard by you. We know, Lord, that you um, feel our pain. You know our condition. That's why you rescued us. Think, Lord, of the old song. We'll understand it better by and by. Lord, even as we understand it more and more as we mature in you, we pray that you help our, our unbelief. We pray that you strengthen our faith in you. And as we meet around this table today, we gather at the foot of the cross, let, us, let our lives be focused on that which matters. Jesus, crucified and resurrected and living in us, May we live that life to the full, fuller than we ever have by the power of your spirit. For we know it is your will and you're willing to grant that. Lord, let it be so. Let that be our desire. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's partake.
Amen. Thank you, Lord. Anything else, Mr. Miller? I want to ask if uh, Wayne Liebrandt would come forward. I, uh, while away, did watch the last bit of the worship, got to hear Dwayne in the sermon and also Francis sing. I know you were in good hands with the eldership of the church. Would you give Dwayne a hand and, and thank you more than ever. Dwayne has been a uh, 40 year minister, minister, uh, missionary, uh, and he would love to continue that as long as the Lord blesses and our church financially uh, supports he and his wife in that ministry. There is a portion of the yearly gift we'll give to you and a little gratuity for preaching last week. Thank you for representing Christ all these years. Thank you for preaching and representing the Lord last Sunday. We're going to have you do it again. Amen. Lead us in closing prayer. Yeah. Okay, and let's pray before we head out. If you want to stand up, though, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today, to listen to your word, to put it in not only our hearts but our minds, to think and contemplate on how we can apply it as we go out of this place today, and we go out to serve, to glorify, and magnify you in our lives because there are so many still out there who are lost. So many out there that are like ships without a compass. They don't they have no steering wheel. They have nothing. And they are lost, dear Heavenly Father. And we pray that you give us the wisdom, the heart, the passion, and the concern for them to introduce them to you. And we ask that your spirit will touch their lives their ships. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Great week, Facebook.